Yes, good morning, everyone. Glad to see y'all as we get ready to worship this morning. Just want to call your att attention quickly to the In the Life of the Church, if you can pull that out while you're doing that. Good morning, Facebook crowd. Really glad that you are with us this morning and hope you're having a lovely morning where you are. Uh, just a couple of things to point out for you. Uh, coming up Friday, May 3rd, Walk to School Day, a great opportunity for you to share the love of Jesus to our neighbors um, as they are walking their kids to school, either the elementary school or bringing them here. We'll set up a hospitality table, coffee, juice, donuts, even dog treats for the people walking their dogs. So that's May 3rd, and we would love to have you participate in that. You can sign up on the Connect card if you're interested in more information. Touch base with Mike Stir. Um, we also have a really great service opportunity at the City Gospel Mission, and Samantha Perkins is here to tell us a little bit about that. Hi, good morning. So I'm really excited that we have our first um, time serving at City Gospel Mission um, serving dinner coming up. It's on April 24th. And don't worry, there is still a lot that you can help with. <laughs> um, so we do still need lots of help. Um, we have plenty of hands. Um, but what we're looking for are some of the donations for the food um, or gift cards or whatever makes the most sense for you, whatever God is putting on your heart to be able to help. Um, we're looking for those one or two fishes to become 120 fishes, maybe with some left over. Um, but we are serving about 120 guests um, that are at their um, men's home, and um, we'll be serving up um, some nice tacos and um, getting a chance to fellowship with um, these men and hopefully tell them a little bit about, about our God. So that's it. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Sam. And if you want to use the QR code, there's that, that's a link to a Sign Up Genius page. And that way, Sam will know uh, what you are signing up to help provide. If you have more questions, you can bend her ear. She'll be out in the entry foyer after the worship service. Um, all the rest you can take a look at at your leisure. But we're ready to get underway with worship. And so I'm going to invite you. Uh, you can use the Connect card to fill out some interest in any of the stuff we've talked about or other things that we have going on. You can use the Connect card to share prayer needs or if God's doing something special in your life, you can indicate that on the Connect card. But we are gonna take just 60 seconds so that you can finish up any of that stuff you need to do with the Connect card, but more importantly, so that you can get your minds and hearts ready. We're here to meet with the Lord. And I believe the Lord is gonna show up and that the Lord has something say to each one of us. And so take this time to finish up the Connect card, but then to get your hearts ready and tune your ears to listen to that still small voice of the Lord. Let's take 60 seconds. week long we've waited for this day to gather today in his name in his presence to sing his glory let's stand and let's do that right now Like a fire, awaken 
we're standing in awe of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's turn to each other and give each other the peace and the love that Jesus Christ offers. Peace be with you all. Good to be with God's people, isn't it? Good to see each other, good to worship. And let us continue our worship now as we call on the Lord, as we worship him, let us pray. Lord, you are amazing. You are gracious, you are caring, you are thoughtful. There is no God ever conceived that compares with you. You alone are good and gracious. Lord, we sang this morning that you would open our eyes, that we might see you. And that's our prayer as we worship you this morning, that you might open the eyes of our hearts, that we may see you, that you would unplug our ears, that we may hear the voice of your spirit, that we may savor your presence among us. We celebrate, Lord, that you are gracious, that you are kind, that you are good, that you care for your people, and over and over again, you show your goodness to us. We thank you, goodness, in the, in the uh, sunshine, in the weather, in the light, in the grace, and the peace. Lord, we bring to you our cares and concerns today, our anxieties and our fears. We bring to you our failures and our inadequacies, and we lay them at your feet. And we thank you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that You've given us everything that we need for life and godliness and love. And you've sent our, your spirit into our hearts to empower us to rest in you, to know you, and to serve you. And so we bless you this morning. We celebrate you this morning. We praise you this morning. We worship you this morning. You are good. And you are good to us. You are good, and you are good to us. And we come now with the prayer that your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, gave us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Russell. Thank you, Stephen. One of the really cool things we have coming up is next week, a visit from Transforming Jail Ministries. Jane Howard of the Mission Committee is here just to uh, tell us a little bit about next week's visit from Sean Whiskey. So Jane, go ahead and storm the stage. While she's on her way up there, one of the things she's gonna talk about is during the 10 o'clock hour, Sean is gonna be offering a, um, a brunch and learn. She's gonna talk more about it I know we've got a Sunday school class, a women's small group, a number of other things going on. I don't necessarily wanna steal from those other groups, but my challenge, those of you who may be not plugged in to something yet, give a good listen. Maybe being a part of this mission's brunch and learn is the way for you to take the next step. Jane, tell us more about what's happening next week. Good morning. Um, I'm here to invite you all to our brunch and learns. When Russell came to our church, 
um, he brought the idea of a lunch and learn, which we had, but then we realized, you know, the people who go to the nine o'clock service, we're asking them to come back, go home and come back at 12 o'clock. So we changed it to a brunch and learn. And I have to say, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, you get to really talk to our mission missionaries and the people from the mission groups, and you can ask questions, and you just find out a lot about what's going, what the, you know, the way they're bringing Christ to our community, to our country, and to the whole world. And so it's just been a wonderful experience for me. Um, and so next week, we're having a brunch and learn, and we serve like light breakfast food um, with Sean Wooski, who's from Transforming Jail Ministries. And we also have, um, this month, we are collecting eyeglasses, readers, plastic readers, because what happens when people become incarcerated, they can't, you know, they don't have, and they don't have their glasses with them. And how can we ask them to read the Bible if they can't, if they don't have anything to read with? So I'm hoping all of you can look through your drawers or go out to um, Walmart, you know, anywhere and pick up a couple pairs of plastic. The only thing they ask is that the readers be plastic. Um, there are some good bargains out there. Um, so I'm hoping you can all come next week to hear Sean. He has a wonderful ministry going. Um, we also, at Christmas time, we have baked cookies because one thing they like to do is when people are incarcerated, um, you know, it's Christmas time, and they, they a lot of times don't have family around or anything, so uh, Transforming Jail Ministries tries to provide cookies for everyone who's incarcerated, plus the, the people who are working there who are, you know, there Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So I hope to see you next week. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much, Jane. And again, I, I encourage you. I know we got a lot going on. And I, I know for some folks that's, that's hard. It's like, I'm in this group, I'm in that group. That's the sign that the Spirit is doing something in our midst. That we've got a bunch of opportunities happening at 10 o'clock. And so I'm particularly calling to those of you who maybe aren't plugged in. Maybe God is giving you a nudge that just next week, hang out for the 10 o'clock hour and learn a little bit more about the good work that our church is doing through our mission partners. So I invite you to pray and ponder and think about that as we prepare to receive God's tithes and our offerings. more than what you see I'm not defined by what I do I know what the world wants me to be but I close my eyes to find the truth so I breathe deep and take my stand I know exactly whose I am I'm Abba's child, sweet and wild The soul inside this skin Such a bright he made from potter's clay I belong to him Shame told me to walk away But love pulled me back in Now I'm reconciled Some. Um.
Today's scripture comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 1 through 14. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like, a little, like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this, of this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills 
and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God bless the reading and the teaching of his word. Amen. So I'm going to try something a little different today because I'm going to try moving up here just because as I'm doing this thing down front, I see some of y'all like craning your neck around other people. So, you know, this way, this way I can keep an eye on you. I see you when you're sleeping. I know when you're awake. So, <laughs> anyway, um, so we have started a new series. We're calling it Called to Serve. This is growing out of our elemental church's strategic planning stuff. And we introduced this series last week, talking about our personal calling to serve. And, and, and looked at Psalm 129 and really digging us into um, how we have this, um, this inner resource of God's calling on our lives, God's equipping, the, the, the vast uh, grace that God gives to us as we pursue our missional calling. Um, and then the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about the populations that we and our leadership of our church feel like we are called to serve, that we are called to chase after, that we are called to you know, bend our resources towards reaching. Not saying we're trying to exclude other folks, but who are we being really intentional about trying to reach? And the first of those is families. And um, from the vision, you know, as we talked about these three different groups, we talked about families and we say, Families here will experience an environment where faith is at the core. We're trying to, to, to reach them in a powerful way. And, and we, as we, let me just give you a little, uh, peel back the curtain and talk a little bit about kind of as the Elemental Church's team was working on this and folks who are on the team, I'm hoping I'm representing this rightly and fairly and if I'm not, they'll, t they'll let me know. But, but as we wrestled with this, one of the things that emerged pretty quickly, we knew that families were always a core constituency of this church. We just talked about the heritage and the things that this church has always done, always valued well, and we looked back at that. But then we also looked at demographically where we are. What's the mission field where God has placed us? And we've seen not just in the city of Madeira, but also in many of the surrounding communities that we serve, it's families that are moving in here, here in Madeira for the great schools, but also in the surrounding areas, we've got some other great schools. Families are coming here. Uh, th th this is where God has placed us. This is a big part of the community in which we've been placed. And we've got um, lots of great ministries already. You know, I mean, we can look at our Sunday school. I mean, it's so interesting. Everything got put on pause for COVID, everything, the world got put on pause for COVID. And then, so just in the short time that I've been here, seeing these ministries bounce back and come back in, you know, our Sunday school, our children's choir, we've got the intergenerational mission trip going down to Appalachia. We've got vacation Bible school. Let me tell you, I've never seen vacation Bible school like y'all put on vacation Bible school. I, I, I look forward to it, not in the least because I get to be ridiculous on purpose. And um, yeah, oh, wait till you see the character I'm working on for this year. Um, we've got, then we've got all these other events like a walk in the woods at Christmas, trunk or treat, graduate recognition. We've had families involved in projects like the kitchen refresh and so many other things. We've got walk to school day coming up. We sponsor scouting here. We do so much to invest in families right now. Um, but as I got into this, as I was putting together this series, I wanted to not just focus on programs or vision. Um, you know, if, if I were following the good leadership playbook, I would have crafted um, some visionary stuff 
you know, all right, we're going to, here's the hill we're going to take regarding families. This is how we're going to do it. Uh, our elemental churches team still has some more work to do on that. But this is a worship service. This isn't uh, necessarily about me trying to be super leader guy. What I thought we would do for the next three weeks is just take a look at God's word. And how does God's word perhaps shed some light on these three constituencies to whom we are called? And as, as I was putting this series together, you know, I knew I wanted to do that intro. But then the other three, it, it quickly emerged that the Gospel of Matthew has sections that speak to a degree to each of these three constituencies. And this is the passage I chose about families. Um, and so let's just listen to the Gospel of Matthew and, and, and just try to think about our calling to to uh, serve families in light of what we have here. Uh, So the first thing we get in this Matthew 18, um, we see Jesus, um, at this time, the disciples came to Jesus, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to them and placed the child among them, and he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now let's just pause there for a moment. one of the things we see right out of the gate in this is um, this passage is focusing on us. So it's not necessarily focusing us on how do we serve families, but it is focusing on our hearts. If we want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. If we want to, to, to discover what it is to pursue Jesus' mission and, and calling and purpose on our lives, we want to do more than check the boxes. Then Jesus is going to give us an example. That's, they, that's what the disciples were looking for. They're, they're hungry. They're yearning. Okay, how do, we, how do we pursue your calling? And what does Jesus do? He takes a little child. Now, we also have to dial back to first century Middle Eastern culture. In in our culture, we live in a culture primarily of nuclear families, mom, dad, two or three kids. Um, And we've got, we have seen this emergence, kind of a return to um, to kind of a 19th century thing where now we are starting to see multi-generational households. We're starting to see households of, uh, you know, that, that combine different family dynamics. So kind of that, that ideal of post-World War II American life of the nuclear family in a plot of suburbia, you know, that lovely picture from, that ruled from the 1980s till, till about 2000, that, that's morphing and changing, but that still shapes our imagination. And when I hear people talk about, well, we need to reach families, that's usually what they're talking about. But in the ancient world, uh, this idea of family was very different. And, and I suggest, as we start to see some of these cultural changes, we may be starting to move back towards something akin to, in the ancient world, extended families live together in a household called an oikos. You've heard me talk about this idea of the oikos. Um, at least in, in Greek areas, it was oikos. and Hebrew areas, it's the bait, the house. You know, it's, uh, but this is true all across the ancient world. Greece, Rome, Israel, all across the ancient world, uh, at least in the ancient Mediterranean world. People lived with their extended family in the oikos, and it would be multiple generations, grandparents or aunts and uncles that maybe um, were unattached or maybe attached. You would have cousins many times growing up together. You would also have retainers and servants uh, that would be a part of this household, and they'd all live in the same house. Uh, It would be a complex of houses with multiple rooms, usually usually built around a central courtyard. And and the house would be the place where the family business was run. And everybody would participate in the family business. Now, again, in the ancient world, we've got it so good. We've got so much leisure time and so much 
uh, surplus. In the ancient world, even you know, relatively prosperous middle-class folks, they're having to work their tokuses off just to make it. You know, unless you were one of the super elites, um, you, you were still working really hard. Everybody in the family participated in the family business. And children were primarily valued because they could contribute to the family business. And children would learn at a very early age. In Peter's fishing household, I'm certain that there were little children running around learning how to make fish hooks and learning how to weave fish nets and those kind of things. You, know, you start learning as soon as you're able to start learning. You start learning the family trade and learning how to contribute. But little children... They're not terribly economically productive, are they? Let's be honest, folks. Little children are forces of chaos and destruction. And we love them. <laughs> but, yeah. And, 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 and so, you know, little children are cute. Um, but in an economy where you are, you know, just trying to make it by and everybody's got to be on task, they can also be a tremendous distraction. So they oftentimes were not as valued. They were tolerated. You know, go off and go play with the other kids. Get out of the house. Scram, kid, you bother me. Um, add on to that, in the ancient world, the child mortality rate was heartbreakingly high. It was crushing. And, and, and so you know, that, that affects your bonding, as it were, with children. So, so a child, the, this statement that Jesus makes, is going to bring the little child, and he's going to say, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's astonishing, staggering, mind-blowing. He's saying, unless you become childlike in your faith. Unless you realize you've got nothing to contribute that the kingdom needs. Unless you realize you've just got to receive. You are a dependent. And that is a hard pill to swallow particularly for those of us who are a little advanced in years, and we've got some accomplishments under our belt, and we think we've got some mighty good things to contribute to the kingdom. And, and as a matter of fact, you know, maybe, Lord, you ought to just listen up. I've got, you know, I think I could run this thing pretty well. Now, you see, the little child is humble. The little child knows he or she is not in charge. The little child knows he depends upon mom and dad for everything. And so as, as we think about our calling to minister to families, one of the things we can receive as we minister to families is receiving by learning again what it is to be a child. You know, so often in churches, and I see this, you know, we treat children like, okay, just be quiet, just go off and do your thing, and let us just do the grown-up stuff. No. Our children teach us. And I'm not just talking about, again, not just my biological children, if anything is close to the oikos of the ancient world, it's supposed to be the church. It's supposed to be the community of faith. The children of this church teach you about faith, about dependence, about trusting in the Lord. One of the other things the children teach us is how little control we have over other people. Parents, you understand this very well, don't you? <laughs> you know, uh, it's very easy to try to just kids get in line, shape up. 
One of the, I've made many mistakes as a parent over the years, a lot of mistakes. Um, and one of the things I've learned from early, early on, was that I could either teach my children they needed to comply with a certain standard of behavior, or I could teach my children that I have a vibrant living relationship with the living God. But many times those two were in conflict with one another. And if I wanted my children to know that I know Jesus, I talk to Jesus, I have a personal relationship with Jesus, I had to let go of trying to control their behavior all the bloom and time. And that was hard. <laughs> that, that was hard on a number of things. Um, I hope it paid off. I believe it did. The same is true for us as a community of faith, folks. We can try to get our children to line up nicely and be good and just do all the things. Do all the things right. But there's nothing of grace in that. You know where grace is found? It's found in hearing, I am Abba's child. I'm beloved, I'm cherished. And I am delighted. I'm a delight to God. And we get to be instruments of that. We get to be vessels and channels of that. And that's when we, when we baptize a child, we all say, take vows to that family. And part of those vows is that, that we're not just going to pat the kids on the head and say, scram kids, you bother me. But rather, we're going to be vessels and instruments of the Father's blessing and benediction to those children. And you know what? It's not just to those children. Jesus teaches us this, you know, be like a child so we can be a blessing to one another. So that we can be as vessels and blessings and instruments to one another. And so, um, childlikeness becomes this model for us. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. As we come in humility, as we come in grace, as we come knowing we need to receive, we become vessels of that grace to other people. Now, the next piece that I get from this that ties to this calling to families is this idea of protection. Children need protection. I mean, that, this was part of what the household did. The oikos was your your social safety net, the oikos, the household, was your protection uh, against a relatively hostile world. Take a look at where Jesus picks this up in verse 6. And again, many times when we memorize these verses, we take these out of context and we just, but listen to all of this in the context of this become childlike. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed and crippled than to have two hands or two feet or be, and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away it's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Now, a lot of folks, they zero in on that and, and they kind of make it into some kind of personal, oh, I've got to you know, do my sin management program. But read it in the context, you know, and, and there's something to that, but read it in the context of causing others to stumble, particularly causing the little ones to stumble. What, he's, what I think he's getting at is what do we do that harms other people? What do we do that crushes their spirit, that breaks their heart? Now, the obvious immediate thing is, you know, the, the obvious 
abuse, neglect, and those things. Children obviously need protection from those. We obviously need to not do those. We obviously need to shield and protect our community from those. This is where the Holy Spirit leads us. But I think there's more subtle stuff. You know, it's, there, there's subtle things. Even the most well-intentioned people inadvertently cause harm. A careless word, a moment of cruelty, a moment of just vindictiveness, bitterness, emotional manipulation. These things leave scars. And these things hurt. Guilting, shaming, pressuring. Again, there's a difference between trying to teach and trying to control. And when we try to control, when we try to exert control over another human being, not just teach them, but controlling them, making them an extension of ourselves subconsciously, we harm them. When we try to extend our identity through another person, we harm them. And that is where I believe we're being warned. We need to rigorously examine ourselves in the light of Christ. Because all that controlling behavior, all that guilting, all that shaming, all that stuff we do to try to manipulate other folks, do you know where that comes from? That comes from us not fully realizing our identity as beloved children in Christ. And that is why we need to cut those things off. We need to examine ourselves in the light of grace. And in the light of grace, Christ prunes those things out from our lives. You want to help children? Grow spiritually yourself. Parents, you want your children to thrive? Go deeper into who you are as a beloved child of the Lord and let that transform your interactions with your children. Folks in the church, you want to invest in children? Go deeply into your identity as a beloved child of Christ. And then you too can offer that benediction, that blessing to every child that stumbles across your path whether you're a Sunday school teacher or whether you just run into them in the entry foyer or whether you're having breakfast with them at Easter. We protect children. We, yeah, we got to set up structures to protect children. But one of the best things we can do to protect against the inadvertent harm is to examine ourselves in the light of grace and be transformed by grace. And then... Jesus continues on. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Honestly, I'm still trying to figure that. You know, that, that that's one of those head-scratchy verses that asked me when, I, when we get into glory and maybe I'll understand it. But, you know, it's, it's pretty powerful. But, but then pick up verse 12. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, Truly, I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Now, again, you know, it's, it's framed in the context of this whole discussion about childlike faith. And so, yes, this does apply to, you know, the adult that's wandering off. But this also applies to this idea of pursuing our children and our families. There's an urgency in this. And as, as I was thinking about this, to come and talk about this, I, w- I wanted to reframe the urgency as a purposefulness. Because urgency, to me, when I use the term urgency, I get this kind of anxiousness that grips my heart. I don't know about you. You know, there's an urgency to the gospel. I'm anxious. I, I got to go. I got to, I got to, as, as though it all depends upon me. And if anything we've learned from the earlier parts, no, it doesn't depend upon me. Jesus is in charge. But there is a purposefulness that this 
parable, the father is purposefully seeking out all the lost sheep to show them that they are loved. And we are invited to be a part of that search. There's a purposefulness. Will you be a part of that search? Will you help seek the lost sheep? Will you help find the tender lambs? And tell them how much the Father loves them. Tell them how much the the Father cherishes them. Tell them how distinctive. Again, 99 sheep, one wanders off, but that one sheep is worth chasing because that one sheep is distinctive. Do we share that same purposefulness as we've grasped the love that the Father has for us? Do we share that same purposefulness that every child no matter what their mental or physical capacities. Every child, no matter what their abilities, is cherished as a child of the Father. And that's not dependent upon age. You were cherished no matter what your capacities. You may be an oddball, an eccentric, a weirdo. Hey, hey, welcome to the club. (laughs) Birds of a feather. (laughs) But you were cherished. Nothing will take that away. That, I think, shed some light on our calling to families. If I would summarize what I get from this passage about this calling to families, I would summarize it as this. We are not called to be vendors of religious goods and services that present interesting and clever programs that, uh, that you know, parents drop your kids off and we'll do the religious stuff and they will get all the religious instruction. No, we're not called to be vendors of goods and services. We're called to be an extended family of God. And to show the children and the families what it is to relax and be cherished by God and to grasp the grace of Jesus in their lives. And to do that, we got to experience it in a deeper, richer way ourselves every day. So with all that ranting and raving done, I'm going to leave you to have a few minutes of reflection. Again, God's been talking to you all through this worship service, and it could be through anything, a song, a minute for mission, a prayer, maybe even the sermon. What's the Lord been saying to you? Use that uh, reflection page on the back of your order of worship to jot down your thoughts. What are you hearing from the Lord? And what's one small step of faith you're going to take in response? Let's abide with the Lord.
deep down, I know that uh, God is here with us. And uh, I know that God can do anything. We just let him. So let's stand and sing that nothing is impossible. sisters, go in grace, go in mercy, go in peace. May the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>